in a COVID slash post COVID world, I feel like the thing that people are now most interested in figuring out is how to effectively manage the flow of people. How many people are in a space? Where are they? How do they get there? Where are they going? I can tell you personally that I've been involved in a number of projects where the end user is attempting to assess the veracity of using various technologies to detect the number of people on board, either mass transit vehicles, trains and buses, as well as in K through 12 and higher education environments. For these end users, so far anyway, their first thought is adding video surveillance cameras. The next thought is maybe Wi-Fi and Bluetooth sensors. However, both of these options, while technically capable, and we can discuss the efficacy of both, they come with a slew of privacy concerns. For one, and look, I'm a realist, I work for a company that manages the flow of data from video surveillance cameras, and of course I understand that in our society, video surveillance cameras are ubiquitous. But the more cameras that get added in general into society, the more privacy advocates are going to be concerned, and they're already leery of the number of cameras that are in use in society in general. Am I, are you, comfortable with living under constant in-your-face video surveillance every time you step out into the world? The other option beyond uh, video surveillance cameras is Wi-Fi and Bluetooth sensors, which sniff for the types of signals that your devices emit, right? Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And those sensors attempt to extrapolate the number of people in a space, given that each device has its own unique identifier. And again, there are technical limitations to these that we can certainly discuss. That said, when these technologies are combined, video surveillance cameras, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth sensors, this sort of opens up this veritable Pandora's box of privacy concerns. Because now you have a very close up, high resolution video surveillance camera combined with personally identifiable information such as your cell phone's MAC address, for example. For some of us, that's perfectly fine. You may be willing to give up a certain amount of your personally identifiable information in return for a service or for security. However, for an increasingly larger and larger portion of society, this give and take has become a bit too much. And personally, as a security practitioner, I tend to lean toward the side of the privacy advocates on this one. Once that genie is out of the bottle, once you have allowed for broad government surveillance at the individual level without due process or probable cause, it's very difficult to put that genie back in. So, all that's to say, what are the alternatives? And in today's episode, I'm going to be talking to Quanergy, specifically Gerald Becker. They are the manufacturers of LiDAR sensors. What is a LiDAR sensor? How are they used? We're going to answer these questions as well as how can you combine that technology with Security Center to provide your facilities and those of your end users with a much more robust security posture while also being privacy conscious. So let's dive in. All right, everybody. So as promised, I'd like to welcome to the uh, to the YouTube channel uh, Gerald Becker from Quanergy, who is here to talk to us about LiDAR and people counting and how we can do these things in a responsible fashion. So, Gerald, welcome. Who are you and what is a Quanergy? Bill, thanks for having us. Uh, appreciate uh, you inviting us to join in on this uh, podcast that you guys that you've been putting on for quite some time now. I'm a huge fan of what you've been doing and educating the industry and talking about relevant topics that uh, resonate with uh, today's day and time with different technologies that are out there. Thank you. Um, so who is Quantity? I get that all the time. So uh, Quantity is a global hardware and software company, and uh, we are specialized in manufacturing of LiDAR technologies and the development of perception software. Uh, we were founded in 2012 and we're headquartered in Sunnyvale, California. I do have to make a point that we are global. We have 
offices throughout the world and every major uh, region throughout the globe. Fantastic. And so what is LIDAR? So I'm sure some of uh, the followers of the podcast understand what LIDAR is. Uh, some folks don't. Maybe you've heard of radar before. Um, but what what is LIDAR? Mm -hmm. So I get this all the time. And to be frank with you, it's, it's pretty interesting to see that um, most people don't understand what LIDAR is outside of what it's traditionally been known for in robotics or, or what it's being used in the future of autonomous vehicles. So uh, LIDAR stands for light detection and raging. In fact, uh, most people have heard of LIDAR or are currently using it like in their mobile devices. Uh, you see LIDAR inside of uh, Apple phones. Um, as I mentioned earlier, LIDAR is most commonly known as the hardware that will assist autonomous driving, um, used in robotics, used in terrestrial uh, mapping uh, on drones uh, to do uh, land canvassing, so on and so forth. And uh, really the history of LIDAR goes back much further than what we're all thinking about as far as autonomous uh, cars go. Um, the technology it's, itself was first used in the 1960s and it was originally intended to track uh, satellites and military targets. And that's the same idea that's being used in LIDAR technology uh, of today, using light to track position of objects. It's uh, literally a time of flight sensing technology that emits a low powered eye safe laser beam. And what it does is it measures the time that it takes for the laser to complete a round trip between the object that it hits and for it to come back. And what it's doing is it's sensing uh, using time of flight. And what it does is it creates a point cloud. The resulting data is used to generate what this point cloud is. It provides both spatial location, depth information, and it allows you to identify, classify, and track moving objects. So we'll talk about this here shortly, but within Genetech Security Center, all this data can be uh, visualized and derive insights that, uh, from the data through several different plugins that we have. So we'll chat about that in a second. I think one of the really cool things with LiDAR, and I'm sure a lot of people have seen it, but not necessarily have like put the put two and two together is like when you see those really cool, almost like predator style graphics of a city and it looks like all these like little dots have come together to form what we know to be the city or we know to be this road or whatever it is. And that's that's the point cloud and that's coming from these from these LIDAR sensors. And you mentioned earlier about autonomous vehicles. So I think. Um, Alphabets, Google, Waymo, whatever they call themselves these days, I think their autonomous vehicles are using LiDAR technology. And, and like you said, pretty much anybody with an iPhone that's got Face ID is using a LiDAR sensor. Is that right? Absolutely. And, you know, one critical point to address here is the fact that these technologies are being used for autonomous vehicles. You know, this is, you know, literally life and death situation. If you're putting cars and making them drive by themselves out in the world, then you can definitely understand that these type of technologies are going to be, you know, very mature in the sense of how they're being deployed with uh, the AI and the analytics that are used to be leveraged on top of that to understand the landscape as far as moving objects. Um, you know, this is definitely the technology of the future and how we're going to be using the physical security space is going to be very interesting. And, you know, I'm looking forward to talking more about you know, funny you say that. So I'm I was uh, doing some research for this episode, and obviously you guys have a ton of information and and a ton of like really cool, useful videos on your YouTube channel, which well I will link to down below. And it got my brain like really excited. <laughs> it's a weird way to put it, but I got really excited about like the future of the security industry because it's sort of like what I said at the outset with regard to privacy cameras do a really, really good job, and they're going to continue to do a really, really good job of gathering lots of data and, you know, all of that data being personally identifiable, but in a two-dimensional way, right? So a camera can only show you, you know, recreate images that are being, or that are coming in from a lens and hitting a sensor in a very sort of uh, flat, flat way, whereas these LiDAR sensors can reconstruct an area in real time in three dimensions. So in today's world, in 2021, the point cloud is not super high resolution. I mean, you I'm sure you could talk about the resolution of the point cloud, but I can foresee a time 5, 10, 15 years from now where the point cloud, where that data is actually quite high resolution and would 
my prediction, if you want to write down my prediction in 2021, what 2030 or 2035 might look like, I think you'll see a reduction in the sale of traditional cameras and have cameras replaced by LiDAR sensors because I just think that the data that they generate is just far more useful. That's a great point. Um, albeit, we don't ever see ourselves being a complete replacement, but uh, something that can definitely adopt and provide additional value uh, to existing sensors out there. So, you know, the way that we look at it is that, uh, you know, we, we look to complement existing solutions that are out there. So we add the third dimension outside of what you just covered is, you know, we're, we've been so accustomed to seeing things in, in a 2D space where we can only see what's in front of us, but anything to the side, to the top, to the bottom, or from an angle has traditionally been difficult to understand unless you bring in, you know, different types of technologies, which is LIDAR, right? So right. our solutions can can do, I mean, it, they're highly robust. We talk about the future, but the future is literally now. Uh, yeah, I mean, sorry to cut you off, but you, you, got me, you got me again excited because, yes, in today's world, you're right, they're, they're sort of complementary devices. And we'll talk about like the RSA plugin and, and how Genetech can sort of correlate data from LiDAR with other, uh, with other sensors like other cameras and whatnot. But well, and actually, let's let's dive into that a little bit more. So what would be some practical use cases for for LiDAR right now? Oh, gosh, so there's quite a list. In fact, uh, you know, at the very top, you know, some of those being people counting, occupancy, density, statistics for flow management, proximity detection, perimeter protection. And that's just the, the top, you know, top level use case applications. From there, you have a slew of different uh, real world applications where our solutions are being used at, you know, for RTLS, real time location tracking, for venues to track large crowds and understand the flow of people in large venues. Uh, in retail, we understand the guest journey, uh, cu customer analytics uh, for perimeter intrusion detection or for like critical infrastructure, transportation, airports, commercial buildings. We're analyzing for uh, any sort of intrusion, maybe even rooftops as well. We're analyzing anyone that's potentially breaching a certain area where they shouldn't be. So there's a plethora of different applications to be used. And they all start from the overarching uh, use case, which is flow management understanding objects in a mo in a open space uh, that's something that we're that we excel at that's our, our prime go to market is that we are tracking all moving objects within the space and understand what they're doing at any given time with our solution so is the technology so good right now as to be able to tell the difference between like classification differences human versus car versus animal Absolutely. So our solution, we can detect three different uh, distinct uh, objects. Uh, first is humans. The second is vehicles. And then our third is uh, unidentified objects. And in unidentified objects, we classify that uh, various different things. So uh, we have a unique use case that one of our partners has developed to basically track uh, um, horses uh, racing around a track. And in that scenario, that would be an unidentified or uh, unidentified or unidentified object in that sense. But What's really cool about that is that he's able to get centimeter accuracy of where that object is within that scape and understand to the centimeter where that horse is at to provide a new level of engagement for broadcasters or maybe guests at a casino. So there's all kinds of different things that we do, but those are the three distinct objects that we're able to track within our solution. Yeah, I can imagine uh, I, I've worked with an end user once and uh, a pretty large retail customer and they were worried about roof penetration right they had after hours lots of really expensive stuff in the store and they were afraid of folks coming in from the roof and then burrowing down into the store but the problem typically in that sort of environment is yeah there's all sorts of sensors you could put up there but unless those sensors can classify human being versus anything else yet you tend to get so many false alarms that it's almost not really valuable right you're you're dispatching more people to manage false alarms and then what does a false alarm become it becomes background noise until there's a real alarm and then nobody responded to it because they were so used to the false alarm which is why a sensor like a lidar sensor would be really beneficial because then it could legitimately say with a high degree of accuracy no there's a human on your rooftop right now and and now you now you need to do something and that's one of those things that 
you know, kind of tying the conversation into Genetech is something that could be done like with a mission control, for example, if like uh, if we wanted to kick off a workflow and a very specific standard operating procedure, we could say, hey, if this sensor detects a human during these hours, then I want you to, you know, play these messages, send, uh, you know, play these sounds, send these emails, and at the command center, start this standard operating procedure for this level of, um, you know, of responder. So, by, but all of that is so reliant on the classification. You need to know that that's a human because otherwise, that that's the one that's the weakest link in the whole thing. Absolutely. So, so what are the what are the ranges of these things? Because this is the question that I get the most. Like traditionally, with like a, a video surveillance camera, if we're doing like you mentioned earlier, people detection, and something that I mentioned at the outset as well, you know. Everybody in this post-COVID world is going crazy for people detection. We want to know, are people in a space? How many people are in a space? Flow management, all, all these kind of things. And the, the first thought is, oh, I'm going to go to cameras and I'll use video analytics to count the number of people coming through a space. And we can, we can wax poetic on why that's not necessarily the best idea. Can it be done? Yeah, it can be done. Are there technical limitations? Are there a ton of variables? Yes. So, but the better solution in my view, I'm sure in your view as well, uh, but a sort of impartial because Genetech doesn't sell cameras, Genetech doesn't sell sensors. Um, in my view, the LiDAR sensor is the preferred method to do this. But then the question always comes back, well, how far of an area can I cover? And how, how what's the distance that these, that these detectors will work in? Yeah, so that's one of the most critical and key questions when you're talking about TCO of uh, a full-on camera solution or camera solution company with LiDAR to solve the unique application of coverage and field of view. Um, so we do have a couple sensors and we'll talk about that here shortly, but uh, with our mechanical sensor, uh, we do have a max range of 200 meters. And when it's coupled with our Cortex perception software, we're able to provide 140 meters of continuous tracking range. So we're able to detect track and classify moving objects within that field of view. So that's a pretty big, large space that you're actually able to see. Now, uh, in some scenarios, what I have uh, seen as of recently with some of our partners is that we've uh, partnered up with them uh, specifically and married them directly with existing PTZ cameras to provide that event to action mechanism where if breached, then go ahead and automate PTZ camera to use its optical zoom and hone into that specific area and do PTZ tracking married directly with our sensor. As you can see, there's only so much you're going to be able to do with a camera, but when you couple it directly with LiDAR and be able to provide that max range of field, field of view coverage that you're going to get with us, it's a whole new world that you'll be able to get new value and new field of view with our with our solution. So I have a, another customer that's thinking about this for a convention space. And again, like convention centers are hard because they do have so many entry and exit points. So to do it with cameras... I'm thinking about one of their main entrances, and there's probably four doors. Each door can basically handle two lanes of traffic. So you're talking about maybe eight total lanes of traffic in a pretty busy area. What I would recommend they do is put in eight cameras, right? So each camera pointing down, getting top of the head and shoulders, and then have it be very specific for that one lane. And listen, that it's, a, it's not a cheap proposition to pull that kind of stuff off. Plus... All the video analytics that have to go on the back end of that, the server that's got to be able to handle that amount of processing data in real time, that stuff starts to spiral sort of out of control very quickly. In that sort of scenario, how many sensors would you need to cover something of, of similar size and scope? Oh, gosh. So what, I've been through this exercise quite a few times as of recent. I'm sure. And, um, uh, we're doing venue tracking for stadiums for... Uh, large open environments where there's concerts and uh, uh, even indoor environments where the, it may be an attraction or some sort of resort where people come in to, you know, take advantage of, of the property and have a great time. And what we've seen is that uh, some of the clients that we're working with are trying to do just that, marry countless cameras and orchestrate them all together to get that whole customer journey from start to finish when they come through the front door and as they engage with all the different attractions and there's quite a bit of complexity that comes with that and when you talk complexity you then start adding you know 
total cost of the solution as you start adding pieces of hardware, labor, installation, orchestration, uh, uh, maintenance. I mean, there's quite a bit of things that come into play. And, you know, as of recent, uh, we did do, uh, uh, we are working with a couple of uh, uh, gaming clients of ours, and we're working towards providing the guest journey and understanding what it would take to, you know, get a, get a client to uh, come out one of the attraction and to engage with some of the facilities inside of the resort. And what we're doing is uh, basically sprinkling sensors all throughout the floor, but because our maximum coverage that we're able to do, we're able to get a larger field of view than you traditionally would with a camera that can only see so far in front of it with a certain field of view and a certain resolution. So, right. you know, we're taking away more than, you know, rough estimate, almost 60% uh, less hardware required on the sensor level alone, wow. just because of the, the amount of coverage that we're able to do. Obviously, the, we are line of sight, um, you know, very similar to a camera. A camera is not going to be able to see through the wall. We won't either. But right. uh, if, the, if it's an open area and there's no objects or no obstructions in front of it, we're going to be able to see anything and everything going on within that environment as soon as someone comes in, as soon as they go through the whole flow of what their experience is. And the best thing about, about it, too, is it's we can fuse all our sensors together to act as one mesh network of LiDAR sensing. So in essence, we could get, as soon as a guest comes through the front doors, and if we have all the sensors fused together, we can literally see the whole journey that that person takes within the venue. So as soon as he comes in, he parks the car, walks in through the front door, walks down the hallway, gets to the resort, starts experiencing things. So we can literally get the whole intent and journey and understanding of how consumers are engaging within that, that open space. Uh, and I want to really drill down on that point, but I want to go back to something that you said. So in that scenario where they were thinking about, oh, I'm going to use cameras and I'm going to try to do this with cameras. Basically, you can reduce or in this for this one particular application, you were able to reduce that footprint by about 60 percent. So if they were thinking about deploying 10 cameras, really now they're only thinking about deploying six and not to talk myself out of a job here. But one of the other costs associated with it is your camera connections and your software maintenance agreement from Genetech. Right. So if you're adding 10 cameras to a system well now that's 10 more camera licenses that you need to buy don't don't you all you people leaving me comments in in the comments section about oh genetech and your licensing structure listen i get it but it is what it is if you don't like the licenses you can always subscribe to the software and you get way more with the subscription stand by for more for more information on that uh in uh, in some upcoming episodes but those are sort of the the other costs that come along with this and one of the one of the issues that i see when we start talking lidar is a little bit of sticker shock at first it's like oh i didn't wow camera's only going to cost me x lidar sensor is going to cost me x times whatever four it's like oh my god uh, it's so much but you no you get you really have to reframe your thinking because you're deploying far fewer devices that are way more accurate than what those cameras would be. And you're not also taking into account all of the back end stuff. Again, the servers, the storage, the processing, the camera connections, the maintenance, like you said, right? A camera's going to die and then what? So you got to take all that in, that kind of stuff into account. Anyway, I digress because one of the other cool things you mentioned is creating this huge mesh. And I want to drill down into that because what I think one of my big concerns as a security practitioner and as a security specialist, I worry about the overreach. How much is too much? How good, how, what are we providing to society as a whole? Or are we creating this big brother nanny state where everybody's watching everybody all the time and privacy rights be damned um, in the United States anyway. So when we talk about fusing these devices together and being able to provide an end user with the customer's journey, right? So if I'm a casino or if I'm a resort or if I'm a convention center, or if I'm a stadium and I can fuse all of your devices together and see person X exit their car, get into the stadium and get to their seat and follow them through that journey what else am I getting? What else am I not getting from, from your sensor? Mm -hmm. So 
one of the most important things to address here, I mean, outside of the fact that we can provide centimeter accuracy with our solution, more importantly, one of the most important factors of our solution is that there's absolutely no PII risk. No personal identifiable information is provided with our solution. Our solution uh, does not see like a camera does. We don't see RGB. We can't read signs. We can't read color. We see only mm. things in, in a point cloud. So we think we see moving objects, but if a person comes within the field of view, I don't know that's Phil. I don't know that's Gerald. I don't know who Tom, Dick, or Harry is, regardless of who's in front of the field of view. So I don't know, you know, ethnic origin. I don't know if it's male or female. I just know that there's a human walking around in that space. So, you know, outside of, you know, the big privacy concerns that are going on throughout the world and all the different regulations that are being pushed down, be it biometric issues and or traditional surveillance, such as the big brother uh, uh, topic that you just brought on, you know, we can track moving objects very accurately down in a centimeter, but at the same token, we don't know who those objects are. So you can continue to build on your understanding and analytics as far as what's going on to understand and gain business intelligence. But you can provide peace of mind that people are not being tracked by the type of buyer, the type of consumer, or the, you know, ethnicity, male or female, or who that person is. We don't know. Now, the only way that we could potentially marry to someone and actually identify is if we do integrate directly to some sort of high security solution. So if we're doing like a data center, we're trying to do RTLS or trying to bound to an access control system. So if the person comes up from the perimeter, badges in, we could then marry the technologies together and know, hey, that's John Doe. He came into the facility and we could then start tracking him within the data center and understand where he's going. But I'll tell you why I'll tell you why I don't have a problem with that. Because I could I could see some people saying, well, then what's the difference? You're now you're tracking people and you know who they are. The difference is me going to a stadium for a baseball game is very different than me using my access control card because I've already I have agreed, whether contractually or otherwise, that my credential is my identity. I need to identify myself to get into this facility. So now if you're marrying my point cloud signature with my access control card holder information, well, now I don't have a problem with that because that, that to me is just increased safety and security while I'm on the premises of my employer or at some secure facility. This I don't have a problem with. It's the tracking of individuals indiscriminately without anybody's permission that sort of starts to create this weird gray area because when when is it that you've given up too much and how do you pull that back once that genie's out of that bottle the genie doesn't go back in so so we talked about stadiums and when I, what are what are some other use cases applications for for lidar sensing uh technology yeah so let's let's dig in a little bit deeper so since we're on uh talking genetech here mm. uh, let's talk a little bit about the plugins that we do have available now so working with uh, genetech we have developed uh, four different plugins that uh, we brought to market uh, the first of them is uh, rsa rsa is a uh, perimeter security for object visualization and alarm handling so your traditional perimeter detection intrusion um, you know, looking at transportation, airports, commercial buildings, anything that you want to basically monitor the outskirts of the building or fence line. Uh, we also have a PFA, which is a zone occupancy and social distancing. Uh, this is uh, typically catered more for airports, but can be also used inside of retail applications, uh, big uh, uh, retail stores to understand occupancy and, and the distancing between shoppers. This provides flow management so you can understand how you're doing in certain sections to maybe open up another line to speed up people going in and out to get people to their plan or get people flowing faster and quicker. Uh, the last two, um, TSS. Uh, TSS is um, great for occupancy analytics to count people going in and out of spaces. So your office spaces, your venues, anywhere where there's a choke point where you can stick our, our solid state sensor. We'll talk a little bit about the sensors here shortly. And then uh, the travel time engine, TTE. TTE, I'm super excited about. Uh, this is a new uh, plugin that we've been working hand in hand with uh, your guys' team. Uh, and uh, what this is gonna be uh, allowed to do is it's, it's gonna be used for queue time analysis. And this, what, what it'll do is it'll calculate customer queue times and wait times. So say for instance, in a retail setting or in a restaurant setting, when somebody comes in through the door, 
how long does it take for that guest to get from the opening that door to the menu and then ordering their whatever it is that they're buying or, or whatever it is that they're they're going to order for them to finally convert to a sale to understand that whole journey from start to finish so that's a pretty cool uh, application that we're coming out with uh, here shortly that gives you that analysis and understanding and gives you that PII without actually understanding who the you know, who, who John Doe or Jane Doe is within that field of view. So those are four specific plugins that we have right now with Security Center that you can deploy in all sorts of different ways. So, so to put a finer point on one of the plugins, uh, the the space, the spatial one, what did, what did you call that one for social distancing? It's PFA, Zone Occupancy and Social Distancing. And and basically, what is that able to do? Is it able to tell how far people are apart from each other? The the actual plug itself, so it's passenger flow analytic. And like I said, you guys do have a plug in that's also for retail. But in essence, what the, that tells you is total occupancy. You can actually drill down, married with a camera, and get uh, actual visibility and understanding of you know, the flow of people and how dense or how crowded the environment is. But this will also give you metrics and it'll give you uh, different widgets within Security Center where you can understand total traffic, total count, and then you can start analyzing uh, day by day, week by week, and understand the metrics as far as what your occupancy is, and understand when you need to go ahead and open up new lines for social distance. Right. But I think that's probably one of those technologies that was invented not for this, <laughs> right? It was meant for, to to sort of understand the flow of traffic maybe inside of an airport. But then, you know, COVID comes along, changes things up, and now it's like, well, how can we repurpose some of these technologies? The other one you mentioned was TSS, which is what ultimately has become the people counter for, for Genetech. So we don't call it people counting. We call it occupancy detection. We, but that's predicated on counting the number of people that come into a space, counting the number of people that are coming out of a space, and then giving you a number. Based on that number, we then can set thresholds to say, all right, well, in this cafeteria or in, in this area, if you have more than X number of people, turn on a yellow light and play this message. And then send, you know, send some information to somebody to go clear out that area. Or if that number now hits X plus five, well, now we're at capacity, you know, hit a red light, maybe restrict access, right? So if we're tied in with access control, we could say, all right, we're going to deny access to anybody that's trying to get through this door until more people leave this space. And again, that was that technology was made for transportation systems, and it wasn't for people counting. It was for cars, right? We want to know how many cars were coming through a given area at any given point in time, either using camera technology or LIDAR technology to do that. And, you know, COVID just had other ideas, right? And I guess the, as, as the old adage goes necessity is the mother of all invention, right? Well, what do we have on the table that we can pivot and, and create this? So like passenger flow analytics can be used for, or analysis can be used to detect how far people are apart from each other. So with PFA can, and you probably know more about this than I do. I mean, I'm, I'm wearing the Genetech shirt, but can PFA then be used to trigger an event to say, if people are more than X number of feet you know, in, in, in that sort of proximity to then trigger some sort of alarm? So there's all kinds of different things that, that can be set up within Security Center. So with you guys' alarm, uh, event to action uh, system, there's all kinds of macro events that can be set up if certain sure. thresholds are hit. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, one thing that you can do is if, if there's a maximum occupancy that's being reached, it's getting pretty close, you can automatically then have that set up, uh, set off a slew of different events from digital signage that says, please hold the door, Maybe maybe a mobile uh, text message to someone who's operating on the floor, or whatever it may be, to even move a PTC camera and zoom into a certain area, create a bookmark to notify you of this practice. Hey, this is when you overflowed. You need to hold the line. This is you know this is the video recording. Make sure that we don't do this at this location or that location. Now that we're starting to open up larger right. venues so to educate uh, not only um, um, the existing uh, employees but to also understand. Now that we're starting to open up with these venues, we have to get get acquainted and acclimated to what was once before all this large crowd and flow management right. and what that was before. Because it's, it's kind of strange now, right? 
It really is. <laughs> Going back to normal, like I was watching the the Yankees uh, opening day. I'm like, where is it? The stands are open. People are there. But it's like, where is everybody? Eventually, we will let those stadiums go back to full capacity. Are those stadiums ready for 50,000, 60,000 people when they haven't had that for two years? And, you know, to go back to what you were saying about that sort of ability to alert folks and to alert staff, one thing that I really want people to understand, and, and I'm trying to create a narrative based around this for some of our K-12 customers who are about to receive a, um, for lack of a better term, a buttload of money from the United States government. And they're, they're mandated to spend this money on, you know, co- practices related to COVID, right? So in a pandemic, what do you need to better prepare yourselves for the future? And yes, you can purchase more sanitizing stations, you can purchase more cones and, you know, manage your traffic better and, and things of that nature. But I would posit this. LIDAR and any sort of occupancy management type of system has a benefit now and a benefit later. So if we think about a stadium, for example, or, or a retailer that's going to use these technologies for occupancy management in relation to COVID or a K-12 that's, that's going to be doing the same thing, right? I want to know how many students are in my cafeteria and I can use my ESSER II funding for, for this type of technology. Think about what other sort of really useful metadata that can be derived from these sensors for practical applications far beyond the worlds of COVID-19. I mean, I've got my two shots, <laughs> Gerald, I don't know about you, right? I'm fully vaccinated. I'm, I'm hitting the road. I'm, I'm getting back out there. And I want the world to return back to normal, right? Never forgetting what we had to go through to get here. But boy, oh boy, there's a lot more data that can be packaged up and put on a bow to provide to superintendents, deans of administration, of facilities, um, for facilities directors for stadiums or for other large venues or for retail applications. What are some of those metadata metrics that go beyond just the simple like thought of, oh, COVID-19 social distancing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, in today's day and age, the new norm is understanding where people are going, when they're going, why they're going, and understanding the intent behind all of it. So, you know, this is coming up more and more uh, as of recent. I know it was being planned prior to us getting to the stage now that the vaccination is reaching critical mass, but we really need to understand where people are congregating, where where the masses are, are, are getting together to understand how to get them to spread across or get to where they need to go as far as, you know, the end game, uh, you know, understanding that flow and getting people from point A to B is very important. And it's going to remain, you know, common theme for years to come. I mean, this is not something that we're just going to turn the lights off and we're back to, you know, 2019 pre-COVID, you know, this is, this is going to take some time and, you know, understanding the flow of, of people, understanding the flow of traffic, understanding the flow of any moving object within a venue, place, or, or thing is going to be common practice moving forward. In fact, uh, you know, we do see the, you know, we're very bullish on what's to come, not only this year, but the years to come. But I think LIDAR is going to be imperative technology to provide a whole new level of understanding beyond than what we've been accustomed to as security practitioners, uh, beyond the sensors that we've been so accustomed to for years. Uh, LIDAR is here. LIDAR is here to stay. And, you know, we're super, we're, we're really excited with the level of integration that we have with Genetic alone that you guys have taken it uh, literally under your under your um, under your arm and said hey let's go ahead and create these different integrations and provide a whole new understanding in a 3D space that we've never seen before so I, I think the future has a lot more to show us and a lot more opportunity to gain with uh, LiDAR integrated directly into Security Center and the different applications that we have to offer into the market. Yeah no doubt about it I think uh, you know people tend to think more about video surveillance or cameras, like because it's like a visual thing. Oh, I need to count the number of people. How would I do that? Well, I'll do it with a camera. But I would like for the viewers to kind of just stop and think about what else you could do with a LiDAR sensor when it comes to access control. What if, you know, think about your mustering situations, right? I need to know how many people are still left in the building. 
traditionally with uh, with a traditional access control system, Genetech is no different here. We rely on people that are leaving a building in an emergency situation to muster to uh, to a particular station. For those of you who don't know what mustering is, basically you you create a point at which you bring your access control credential to that uh, to a given area to a designated area and you credential in there, which moves you from one area in the cardholder database to the other or to the in the access control database so that first responders know this person is safe, they have mustered. So if you have a facility that has a 1000 employees, 995 of them have mustered to their muster points, five of them, here are their last known locations. But then if you can marry that data up with LIDAR and say, well, I see three people over here, and one person here and one person over here without having to look at video surveillance cameras and try to ascertain is that a human or not you could very easily say well i know that there are humans over here i don't know which humans they are but i know i have five missing and three of them are over here um i am sure that there are hundreds of other similar type of applications that lidar can be used for that we're just not thinking about enough so uh Real quick, and, and I don't want to take up too much more of your time, and I certainly appreciate you, you doing this with me. For for those of you who want the background details, yes, it is 9.45 p.m. on the East Coast. Uh, Gerald, you're, you're on the West Coast, right? I am. So it's not too late for you. But it's, de- it's definitely after hours for both of us, okay? Um, M8 or the, the M series versus the S series, what is the difference between mechanical and solid state other than the obvious? Yeah, so the mechanical is going to give you wider field of view, 360, high angular resolution, uh, and the solid state is going to give you uh, 50 degree resolution or up to 100 degree resolution. Uh, one sensor is meant for big open space uh, visibility, while the solid state is meant for overhead choke point counting people coming in or out, tracking of objects. So two very specific use case applications. Uh, M8 is, is wider field of view, larger coverage, 360 degree horizontal field of view, uh, 3D, and the solid state will always be your choke point overhead to get people coming in and out. And are these natively like um, like IP based devices, or are they sensors in the traditional sense, like they're they're just going to close a relay, or like how are they transmitting the data? Yeah, so these are actually IP devices. Uh, um, they're indoor outdoor rated. Uh, our mechanicals. Uh, Sensor supports PoE plus, so you could literally just uh, tie it in directly into your network, powered up through a PoE plus injector or through a switch, so you can be up and running within a matter of seconds. And I guess for for Genetech, it's just another license. <laughs> no, it's just it's just another sensor, right? For us, so then we just need to determine what we're going to do with the information that's coming in from from the sensor data. Yeah, you hit it on the nail. So it's it's exactly that. You see our sensor as a sensor as a as a unique device inside of the config tool. So from there, you basically go ahead and start adding to uh, what the sensor can do. If you tie in uh, mapping, if you try an event to action workflow, if you tie in uh, other sensors that you want to marry directly to the alarm event that comes from our sensor, there's a slew of different things that can be done within a security center to add additional workflow capabilities and value to the organization. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just think of, you know, at, at its most basic level, event to action. If this happens, trigger this action. You take it another step further. Well, maybe we want to trigger an alarm. Take it a step further than that. Maybe we want to trigger a threat level. So when this happens, I want these 15 different actions to occur. Or we can bring in the RSA plugin, right? So if the sensor detects a human out at this area, we'll spin this PTZ and follow that object. Or then going the ultimate, you know, uh, sort of bringing together of things is mission control, where we get the we get the trigger, we trigger a workflow. That workflow kicks off a standard operating procedure that can dynamically guide your first responders to uh, to resolution closure. So yeah, I mean. I can't think of a better way to start tying these types of devices together with, for a robust security posture. You know, taking nothing away from Quantergy and the software that you've developed, but this is sort of the standard 
uh, best practice for any Genentech customers, unifying, unify, unify, unify. It's the thing that we beat on the most. You should not be operating your different security practices in silos. You should not have a separate access control system that's separate from video, that's separate from LPR, that's separate from intrusion detection, that's separate from you know your other critical sensors in, in and around your facility, nor should they be separate from this type of stuff. So by bringing all of those things together, you now have this holistic view of everything that's happening in your facility, the tracking of humans and what that means. And if they enter into specific areas, then we can trigger different things to happen versus now I have to pay somebody to sit at a computer and watch these screens all day. And and we all know from the last 18 months that sitting in front of a computer and, and waiting for things to happen is not a recipe for good outcomes. Let's, let's just put it that way. Um, so Gerald, Final thoughts. What um, what would you like everybody to know about Quantergy and your partnership with Genetech, or not? Just whatever you got. Yeah, I, I think I think we we pretty much encapsulated uh, um, everything today really well. I think the overarching message I want to get across is is the TCO, the t- total cost of ownership. Uh, uh, you know, when you look at our solution, our sensors compared to what you've been accustomed to with cameras, doors, analytics, software, license, so on and so forth, you got to look at it in a different way. Yeah, I think you said it best earlier when you think of all these different devices, all the labor, all the cable, all the orchestration, the servers, the maintenance versus, you know, maybe one or two sensors sprinkled within an environment and one server providing the same application use case, but at a much dramatic uh, uh, lower price point, you then to start understanding, you, you then start to understand why our sensors are, are A, you know, a certain price point, but two, provide so much more value than what you've been accustomed to, is the accuracy, the coverage, and the capabilities that you're going to be able to get with our solution. The TCO really paints a different picture when you look at total deployment costs versus other IoT sensors. So you can now see in 3D and gain a whole new perspective that was never avail- uh, available uh, before with other technologies. So the last thing I would say is if anyone would like to see a demo of the solution in action, reach out to us and we'd welcome a live demonstration of the solution in action. Yeah, absolutely. So if you do want to see a demo of this, I mean, hopefully if I've done my job properly as a video editor, I've, I've uh, given you a lot of good information as we've been having this conversation. You've seen some of this stuff in action, but if you would like a more personalized demo, you want to see these things actually in use in your facility, um, Email me. So my email address will be down below. I'll include all of Gerald's contact information down below as well. So if you're not a Genetech customer, but you're watching this video anyway, you can reach out to Gerald and you won't hurt my feelings. Or you could come over to the great world of Genetech where we're happy to have you. Um, to, to wrap up on my side, I guess, Gerald, thank you so much. The, this has been fantastic. Uh, I'd like to have you back if you uh, if you guys come out with something new, different, maybe higher resolution stuff, whatever, if we, or we just want to, if we just want to chat about the world of uh, the crazy world of LIDAR and Genetech together uh, to, um, to just kind of put a bow on this conversation, you know, wrapping up what I said in the beginning with some of the concepts that we talked about here uh, in this conversation, accuracy without having to give up your privacy. I think that's one of the key takeaways as well. I mean, Gerald, you're 100% right. The total cost of ownership when you include all the cameras and whatnot is is a huge factor. Why have to spend all that money and all, all that investment on on all that other stuff when you've got this one thing that does what you need really, really well and really, really accurately without having to get into people's private data? If you know how many people in your facility you don't need to know necessarily without asking for permission exactly who those people are right if you if you've got permission right if i if i'm an employee and i want to come into your facility and you want to know well it's phil and i want to track phil throughout my facility well that's sort of like a, an agreement that we've come up with ahead of time but getting onto a bus or a train or a plane well maybe not a plane but definitely a bus or a train or or some other public transportation or just sort of out and about i don't know that i want you to know exactly who i am by sniffing my my phone's data tying my my coordinates 
uh, based on, you know, video surveillance cameras. I don't know if I'm all that comfortable with that. But with this, this is a different story. And I think this really solves the problem, protects people's privacy, and does it far more accurately than anything else on the market. So with that, I'm going to end the conversation here. Gerald, again, thank you so much. Uh, this has been great. If you have any comments, questions, concerns, leave me a comment down below. Did you like this video? Give me a thumbs up. You disagree with anything I have to say? Leave a comment. That's what the comment sections are for. If you really didn't like it, you could give me a thumbs down, but uh, that would hurt my feelings. Make sure you're subscribed. Hit the bell icon, and we'll see you on the next one.